This project, entitled Expanding Aquaculture of Soft Blue Crabs, Technology Transfer and Production Cost Analysis of Hatchery Pond and Shedding Phases, was funded by NOAA and the Mississippi-Alabama Sea Grant Program, and had the goal of transferring blue crab larval rearing and pond grow-out technology from the University of Southern Mississippi to North Carolina. The principal investigator was Dr. Harriet Perry, a marine ecologist at the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. The co-principal investigators were Dr. Benedict Posadas, economist with the Mississippi State University, Dr. Sam Thomas, owner of Thomas Seafood in Beaufort, North Carolina, Mr. David Sereno, director of the Marine Technology Program at Carteret Community College in Moorhead City, North Carolina, Mr. Eric Herbst, aquaculture extension specialist at NC Sea Grant, and Dr. David Eggleston, professor and director of NC State University's Center for Marine Sciences and Technology. Research in Mississippi was conducted at the University of Southern Mississippi's Thad Cochran Marine Aquaculture Center. Production of soft crabs is based on a three-phase approach. Hatchery grow-out of larvae, intermediate grow-out in raceways to gradually acclimate small juvenile crabs to low salinity, and a final grow-out to either a peeler or soft crab in shallow ponds. That process begins on the water with commercial crab fishermen and the capture of egg-bearing female crabs. Biologists accompany the fishermen as they run their traps and select up to four females with eggs to return to the laboratory for spawning. Each crab is placed in a separate aerated cooler filled with seawater. Crabs that are selected for spawning have freshly laid eggs that are orange in color. Potential spawners are held in quarantine and checked for parasites and disease. Crabs with a clean bill of health are moved to individual aquaria and held until the eggs hatch. The eggs darken as the embryos develop and are black just before hatching. After hatching, the larvae are harvested and moved to large hatchery tanks for larval development. Larvae begin life as zoea. Zoea will go through seven molts to reach a second larval stage, the megalopa. This process takes a little less than one month. The megalopi are harvested and transferred to raceways where they are acclimated to very low salinity. Crabs are cannibalistic and the raceways have artificial habitats that simulate seagrass beds and offer protection. They grow rapidly and within three weeks they are ready to be transferred to ponds. Juveniles used for pond stocking are around one inch in width from tip to tip. Crabs are released into shallow ponds for grow out to peeler crabs. Shedding crabs are harvested from the ponds using bush lines, a folk fishing technique practiced in Louisiana. This unique fishery is based on the behavioral attributes of crabs associated with the molt cycle. Crabs are especially vulnerable to predation at molting, and they seek refuge in the vegetation to escape predators. Thus, the technique is selective for removing pre-molt individuals from the pond. Bushes are composed of bundles of wax myrtle attached to a trot line with gangions. The lines are attached at one and a half meter intervals along the line and are set in the pond in a linear fashion. Multiple lines are spaced approximately two meters apart and rest just above the bottom of the pond. They are run twice each day to check for peelers. Each bush is lifted and shaken into a dip net. Crabs that show shedding signs are harvested and put into traditional recirculating seawater systems located on land. Crabs are held in these systems until they shed to produce a soft crab. So uh, what gave me the idea was being contacted by a crabber named Tim Selby in Bellhaven, North Carolina. And Tim was basically capturing juvenile blue crabs with his uh, trawl net and, and crab pots. And he actually had a freshwater pond in his backyard. He was putting these juveniles in his backyard to see what would happen. And they, they grew like gangbusters. And so he got really excited about the potential for growing juvenile crabs out in fresh water and contacted me to see if we could uh, partner on doing some more sort of quantitative and ecologically relevant uh, experiments to actually test the feasibility of freshwater pond grow out of, of blue crabs. 
You know, we knew that blue crabs occurred in, in almost near fresh water, especially the males. And we knew that uh, uh, you would often see very big males that were found in, in the more freshwater tributaries, or uh, you, you hear about the, uh, they call them swamp dogs in uh, Lake Matamesquite. And so there was a lot of anecdotal information in support of these crabs growing quickly in fresh water. But to our knowledge, nobody had really looked at it quantitatively. And so we ended up uh, writing grants to uh, NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they funded our work to, to actually uh, look at the feasibility of freshwater pond grow out of blue crabs. Uh, and we used the aquaculture ponds in Plymouth, North Carolina that are part of NC State. The, the aquaculture thing, getting into raising them, uh, seemed like the next step because it's getting more difficult to get enough peeler crabs and supply enough soft shells for the market. And uh, it seems like it's, it's getting more difficult each year. I don't necessarily think that supply is that much worse, but I know it's getting more difficult for us to get enough peeler crabs uh, to, to run this operation the way we want it. So reading some reports from Dave Eggleston, and uh, some others, I, I got interested in this. Uh, the growth rate seemed uh, phenomenal, much to my surprise. It's kind of something I wasn't expecting to see that kind of growth rate out of hard crabs and ponds. So we uh, thought we'd give it a try. When selecting a site for pond construction, it's very important to consider the clay content of the soil. The clay content needs to be at least 20% for the ponds to hold water on their own. Otherwise, you'll have to use some sort of pond liner, and water source is the other important factor. Megalope need at least 18 parts per thousand, so a source of estuarine or seawater that is above 18 parts per thousand is very important. For grow out, the salinity can be as low as one part per thousand with a high degree of hardness. The first season we, when we, we stocked the pond with uh, the hatch from southern Mississippi, we use what's called a bush line, and uh, with the help of the students from the community college, uh, we ran four bush lines down in the pond. And the bush line is just, a, it, it ran the length of the pond uh, with a Merkel bush attached in clumps about every 15 feet. And the idea was that the, uh, the peeler crabs, the crabs that are getting ready to shed, would look for, would seek some hiding place, and they would crawl up into the Merkel bush and then as we went down the line and pulled that up, we could capture the peeler crabs. And it was, you know, we, we saw uh, some promise there, but really not to the volume we wanted to, to harvest out of the pond. We did try the peeler traps in the ponds, and they absolutely did not work like they do in the wild. And we only can speculate that the reason they didn't was because uh, the, the, the ratio of males to females in the pond is about 50-50 and there was no need for them to look for other males you know, to, to mate with. They had plenty available. What we want to do is, is the idea is uh, taking the crabs out when they become what we call a peeler crab. And so we can turn them into soft crabs because the market value is much higher as a soft crab than it is a hard crab. So, and we don't want to leave them in the pond because if they shed in the ponds, they're probably going to get eaten by other crabs. Uh, so we don't want the soft crabs to shed in the pond. So we're going to look for the peeler crabs, take them out, and we're going to put them in our shedding tank, and then we'll hold them in there until they actually shed out into a soft crab. That way we can monitor them, we can keep an eye on them, you know, 24 hours, and make sure that the, as they start shedding out, we're not going to experience a, a severe cannibalism. And uh, we use the, we'll, we'll work uh, our shedding operation Somewhere around 75% of what we put in, we actually shed out as, as marketable soft crabs. When we start loading these tanks up, each tank can uh, maximum about 300 crabs per tank. And we don't like to put that many in there. We usually do about 200 to 250. But if we really get pressed, we'll, we can put 300 in each tank. In a period of about four or five days, most of the crabs will shed out, and then we start reloading. We'll buy more crabs to keep feeding it into. There are two drivers of, of this study. One is uh, just to uh, meet market demand. And so the soft shell crabs, uh, at least caught from the wild, are fairly seasonal. 
and there's a tremendous amount of demand uh, by the industry for those soft shell crabs. And so the idea was to be able to uh, uh, stock these freshwater ponds with hatchery reared blue crabs and then harvest those at times when uh, there was a lot of demand but not supply. So that was one reason. The other driver is that the blue crab population in North Carolina has a tremendous amount of pressure and it's actually been at uh, relatively low population sizes since 1999-2000. And so uh, if we had an aquaculture so uh, source of blue crabs, then this might reduce some of the uh, harvest pressure on wild stocks. When collecting sponge crabs from the commercial industry, you want to make sure that they're handling the crabs very carefully and keeping them in water at all times. If that sponge starts to dry out, it'll uh, the, deteriorate the quality of it. Once received at the hatchery, we want to try to minimize any transmission of pathogens. So we will treat them in a bath of potassium permanganate in order to uh, kill off any parasites and, and reduce any kind of uh, bacterial transmission. We will make sure that all the temperature and salinity is the same that they've been experiencing and transfer the crab into the bath for five minutes after which we'll put them in a rinse bucket and then they'll be ready to transfer into their holding tank. So for the, holding the brood stock, you want to make sure that you use a tank that has sand in the bottom. The female uh, will bury in the sand a little bit to sort of protect the sponge and hide. So you want to have uh, a layer of sand and we use these, uh, it's got a gravel filtration with carbon underneath and, and these tubes go down to the bottom so we can aerate through those tubes and it'll act as a filter for the for all the water in the tank. We will measure the water quality, change water as needed to, to maintain uh, low levels of ammonia and nitrite and then once she is ready to hatch we will uh, they usually hatch early early in the morning and we'll come in and we will collect the zoea out of the tank with a small dip net and transfer them into a bucket where we can then count them in order to stock into the broodstock tanks. A female can release up to a million zoea at one time and in each of these 1,000 liter tanks we will add approximately 100,000 zoea and we'll feed them throughout their, their seven zoea stages, rotifers as a first feed and then we'll add in artemia when they get a bit larger through the later zoeal stages. Inside the larval rearing tank, we have five points of aeration. The air stones are elevated off the bottom of the tank to maintain good circulation throughout the tank and keep things well mixed as well as keep the zoea moving around. You can see the screen covering the drain has a large surface area so it does not get clogged very easily. We'll rinse it down with system water on a daily basis. And then there is a plug that we keep in the bottom of the tank to keep both the feed and the zoea from going into that drain pipe and, and becoming stagnant and anoxic. And then right before we are ready to harvest all of the megalope out of the tank, we will pull that plug out. Every day, we feed that 1,000 liter blue crab larval tank 50 million rotifers. We do a batch system. We use a commercial algae concentrate that feeds and enriches the rotifers in one step. And then we do a daily harvest, count them, and then feed the rotifers to the zoea. Once the zoea reach a size large enough to order to eat Artemia, we feed them first Artemia Instar 1 nauplii, and then after we mix in Artemia Instar 2 nauplii, which are a little bit larger, at which point we need to enrich them. So we hatch them out in hatching cones, we'll clean them, remove any unhatched cysts, and count them, and then we'll feed them to the blue crab larvae as a supplement to the rotifers they're already eating. The enrichment formula that we give them is a DHA supplement that the Artemia will take into their guts and that will transfer that DHA onto the zoea when they consume them. Every day we'll collect a plunge sample using this sampling device which will get a sample of the entire water column so it fills up with water and that check valve on the bottom will hold the water in it and that way we'll be able to get 
good counts to estimate the number of rotifers and artemia in the tank as well as zoea and then we can examine those zoea and stage them to figure out what the proper feed amounts and types are for that tank. So, uh, so one of the, the, I think, major outcomes of this project is uh, uh, developing the larval technology uh, in the hatchery to raise these larval blue crabs. And this was a major bottleneck for, or for many, many years. And so the University of Maryland actually figured out how to raise these uh, blue crab larvae in the hatchery. Uh, University of Southern Mississippi then also figured it out. And so one of the goals of this project was actually to transfer that larval rearing technology from Mississippi uh, to North Carolina. I think it's been incredibly successful. I mean, the biggest bottleneck, again, was transferring that larval technology to North Carolina. And so we've now done that. The next step is to, I think, continue to refine the larval rearing technology and then communicate that uh, available technology uh, to industry and see what folks are interested in pursuing that uh, as a line of business. And providing seed crabs, I think, would really help that industry to really take off. I, what I'd love to see in, in five, especially 10 years, would be a, sor a commercial source of seed crabs that is being done by private individuals. And then what I'd also like to see uh, a very efficient means or set of means that we can actually harvest these crabs uh, in, in a certain molt stage that would feed into these uh, soft shell uh, rearing tanks. If we can work out the other details, and uh, even with the four ponds, I think we could extend our, 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 our season here well into the fall, throughout the summer and well into the fall with just those four ponds. If we stock these ponds properly, I think we could stock these ponds uh, at uh, intervals where we could start pulling harvest off and then just rotate these four ponds and get ourselves harvesting uh, through the summer and maybe into the early fall. Results from the economic analysis of current production practices suggest profitability is attainable with increased survival during the hatchery and grow-out phases. Advances in the development of artificial foods for larvae and juveniles will greatly reduce the cost of production in low salinity ponds. Technology transfer for growing blue crabs in the hatchery and brackish water ponds from the University of Southern Mississippi to North Carolina will significantly lower production costs and increase economic return to the farmer. The result is a farm-to-table delicacy to be enjoyed as an appetizer or entree.